Father, loving Lord, blessed Savior. Father, it's times like these that we need to understand more beautifully the purpose you have for each one of us. And I pray today that as we get into the message, the message will get into us. As we invite your Holy Spirit to be in this place, may we invite your Holy Spirit to be in us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. John 3, verse 19 to 21. Black lights matter. I was tickled when the title came to my mind. I'm going to read the scripture, then tell you how it came to my mind. John chapter 3. Follow me as I read verses 19 to 21. There's so many gems in John chapter 3. You know, we all know John 3, verse 16. But this chapter is replete. It's just full. It's like a grocery store. It's a, it's a warehouse of gems. And it just took place between a man by the name of Nicodemus and Jesus. But how many things he revealed to Nicodemus we go back to that and we begin to see, wow, the Lord was really working on a man that had a life that needed to be transformed. He was good at where he was, but the Lord exposed him to so much more, and it is revealed in the book of John chapter 3. Verse 19 begins with these words, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Isn't that powerful? Come with me to the club, the disco, you old people, <laughs> where everything looked great in the dark until you have an encounter with a black light. You remember those days? The music is thumping. The room is highly energized. And you make the mistake and walk over and stand in the UV light of a black light, only to realize that you're not as clean as you thought you were. You remember that? You start doing this in the dark. And it's not working. It's just moving what the black light revealed. It's just moving it into a different location. I remember those days very well. See, those of individuals like myself that were the disc jockeys with the two turntables, we really liked black light because it made the club look inviting. But as you know, there was nothing more disappointing than when the black light was replaced by the real light and the clubs looked horrible. Places you really don't want to get caught in the daytime. But the benefit of the black light was it revealed in the dark what was not seen in the light. And so, therefore, it functioned in a way that you didn't really realize until you had an encounter with the black light. Some of you might be saying, now, Pastor, where did you get the idea from for that sermon? When my wife and I were involved in a Bible study, a pretty lengthy Bible study, we enjoyed doing that, and I would encourage you, if you really want to strengthen your relationship 
with your spouse, get your Bible. Sit down, leave your phone, don't answer the door, don't pick it up, just read your Bible. And you will all of a sudden be amazed, as we were after reading certain parts of the Bible, we were amazed how much we did not see in ourselves until we exposed ourselves to the searching light of God's Word, the black light. You see, black light is a very interesting thing. It, it exists in a realm that is unseen by the naked eye. It's called ultraviolet light. You may have heard about sunblock. It blocks UV rays. Some people go to the beach and they say it's cloudy, but the black light says it's not cloudy. The light is still coming through. And so they say SP40, SP50, whatever the case may be, it really is to block the UV rays, the ultraviolet rays. Then some of you may have been around long enough to remember shades, where the young people now call them sunglasses. And if you, get, if you buy sunglasses, let me just make a point here, don't buy cheap sunglasses. Buy those that literally have UV protection. I spoke to an eye doctor once, and they said, when you buy sunglasses that are off the shelf because you think you want to block your eyes from the sun, you're actually damaging your eyes because when you put a dark glass or dark plastic over your eye, it opens up wider, and the glass doesn't block the UV rays, and it damages your eye quicker than if you had no sunglasses on at all because it forces your eyes to open and allows the UV rays to come in where UV glasses that may cost you more, if you think your eyes are not worth a lot, then buy $5 sunglasses, and later on in life you'll understand why you cannot see as well as you should have. And so, as I began to go down this road even farther, because I couldn't get, I, I literally could not get that thought out of my mind, black lights matter? Black lights matter. And I bounced it off a few of my colleagues at 3ABN and some people that I have uh, respect for. And they said, where did you get that from? <laughs> and I began to go down that road a little bit more, Bob, to find out, okay, if the black light allows us to see in darkness what we cannot see in the light, was there ever a time in history that was so dark that things were revealed that were not able to be seen in times of light. And the Lord tapped on my forehead and said, remember the dark ages? Remember the dark ages? Then I began to recount the dark ages where more Christians were persecuted and killed during the dark ages than at any other time after the birth of the New Testament Christian church. But investigating the reason behind such a massive loss of life, the question that came to me, Leon, was, why didn't they just try to preserve their lives? Why, why be willing to die for something that you don't really have to die for? It's just a book after all. Why put your life on the line when you could just acquiesce in the moment and reestablish yourself later on. What I came to find out startled me because I realized that there is a contrast between the Christians of the Dark Ages and the Christians of today. You see, the Christians of the Dark Ages were willing to die for the little light they had but Christians today are unwilling to live for the abundance of the life they have. And I thought, they didn't have much. The Waldensians, they didn't have the whole Bible. I read how, in some instances, just certain portions of scriptures was all they had. But they would trade at the risk and the behest of losing their lives. They would pass portions of the Bible 
to others, and they would go and read in the, in the den and the caves and the rocks of the mountains, and they would treasure that little so much that if the moment came for them to give up their lives for that little page, they would do it. I re read about the times when the Nazi army came upon many of the Jews that were reading the Bible, and they, they treasured it so much that they, they said they they tried to make as many copies as they could. And so they put uh, 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 that, that purple paper, that copy paper behind, and they tried to type four copies at a time. In order to do that, they had to hit the keys really, really hard. And they were fearful because... They didn't know if they could even trust their neighbors or their friends because they would be turned, they'll turn them in. And so what they did is they hid in the basements and they, the women sat under blankets and another blanket with a, with, a, with a lamp under the blanket that could set the blanket on fire. And then they covered the keyboard with a pillow just to be able to, 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 to hammer out some portion of the scriptures. And they would roll it up or fold it up and walk the streets and pass it to one another. And I thought, this was an age of darkness. And they were willing to do everything they could just to get some light somewhere. Many of them lost their typewriters. They were killed. They were taken out and forced to stand against the wall and, and to confess that they had violated the laws of the land not to read the Bible, and they were glad to give their lives because they read the Bible. I remember when 3ABN went to Russia with John Carter, and they were able to carry Bibles with them, and people stood in lines Lines unimaginably long because they said, we have been waiting more than 40 years to see a Bible. When it was in the city square, under an encasing that you could look through, people stood in lines with pieces of paper and pencils, and they would stand there and copy only the visible part of the Bible they could see, and they would walk away as though they found a hidden gem, a treasure, Diamonds. And Svieta may remember those days. And Julie Ukona remember those days. Those were the moments of dark days. And yet they saw in the darkness what many of us fail to look at in the light. When we look at the dark ages, we think of what the Church of Rome was able to do to Christians, more than 50 million, in the records that still maintain, that are still accessible, because many of the records were destroyed. The rack, the dungeons, the tables where people were stretched and quartered and cut in half and torn apart. Why? Because they just wanted to live by God's Word. And the Bible says the Church of the Dark Ages were so ruthless. Daniel, describing this in Daniel 8, verse 12, says, speaking of how the devil worked through the church, he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this, and he prospered. What was the crime? They just wanted a Bible. That's all they wanted. And here we are, when we, when we think about this, and allow me to just distill this and break this down and get into the recipe of the sermon. You see, the truths of God's word during the Dark Ages, during the, the German Reich, during the persecution that so many people endured, the truths of God's word were distorted. God's word was intentionally corrupted. The Bibles were inaccessible, and reading it was prohibited. And so when I began to look back at all these instances where the only crime was, I just want to read, I just want a Bible. 
They fought over those, those Bibles in Russia. They, when the Bibles were being handed out, the stories were communicated to me. People were grabbing the Bible. No, this is mine. No, this is mine. And they said, no, it's enough. We have enough for everyone. They were willing to die for the little life they had. And today, so many are so unwilling to live for the abundance of the light we have. The dark ages, I could relabel it as the black light era. So I step into another side of that because black light does not mean the absence of substance. It means the obscurity of substance. Because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. The Dark Ages was an era of darkness. But what did it reveal? It revealed the unwavering dedication to God that is missing in our world today. In the Dark Ages, when you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, where well, you've got to read it, you, got, you have to have a strong stomach to read it. It's not a book you can read through without falling apart, without wondering how could man's inhumanity to man be so dark when the only crime was they just wanted to live by God's word. But they learned something that this generation is yet to learn. You see, the illuminating Luminosity, the black light of God's word, allows us to see in this dark generation what so many of them cannot see in the light. So I decided to dive into this and see, okay, well, the Lord gave me this idea. What, what can I find out about black light? And I was listening to the testimony of a scientist. He, says, he said that black light is an oxymoron because black light doesn't exist like civil disobedience or organized chaos. It's an oxymoron. He said black light exists outside of the visual spectrum. In other words, when we look at the visual spectrum, it goes from one, you see a rainbow, it goes from one color to the next. He said somewhere in the middle, as it crosses over into another hue, the light temporarily disappears. It's like the year Zero between 1 B.C. and 1 A.D. There is no year zero. But the crossover is there. You just go from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D. There's a crossover period. He said that is where black light exists. That's where the UV rays cross over. And the crossover is so quick because light travels so fast. He said we don't see it. But with that which illuminates the phosphorus of that moment, it becomes visible where it is not seen to the naked eye. Black light is invisible, the scientist says, but its effects can be seen, as I just talked about. You can see it on your suit. You can see it in different places. He says black light can detect the presence of elements that we cannot see. And the scientist's name for black light is ultraviolet light. They go on further to say it emits what they call invisible photons that collide with atoms in the phosphorus. Allow me to illustrate. There are certain paints that would not glow unless it had phosphorus in it. And so the black light, the UV rays, are continually searching for something that it could illuminate. It's not saying, I want to illuminate the piano, but not the bench. The moment you turn a black light on, it starts searching for something that it could illuminate. And the moment you find it, what happens next is, we call it the glow. The glow. But if there is no phosphorus, nothing will be seen. Give me some examples, for example. 
You can buy a black light at Walmart to impact you like I think you should be about God's word. Go spend a few dollars on a black light and do the following. If you think your bedroom is clean, <laughs> examine it with a black light. And you'll see things that are, get this, hidden in plain sight. If you think your clothing is clean, a black light will reveal things that may startle you. I just washed this. If you think the hotel room that you just reserved is clean, you may, want, you may not want to sleep on the same bed that hundreds or thousands may have occupied because you made the mistake of shining a black light on it. I kept going deeper and deeper into understanding this. When you begin, when God reveals something to you, it doesn't just pull you in. He starts pulling the onion skin back, Mary Kay, and you start seeing things that you say, how old am I? And I didn't see that yet. That is the evidence of divine inspiration. God chooses the moment when he says, I think you could handle this now. And so he unfolded this page. I read that crimes are solved with the use of blacklight. And I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. They have these crimes that were not solved for decades. They call them cold cases. How could cold cases all of, all of a sudden become relevant? Because in the, between the late 60s and the early 70s, in Canada, the law enforcement agency stumbled onto something that we now call black light. It was a coincidental incident. And it happened as they were trying to find ways of seeing what they had not seen. And so they were experimenting, turning different frequencies until they dialed in a frequency that, 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 that mimicked black light, and they started seeing things that were not visible before. And so it didn't start in America, it didn't start in Europe, even though there's some cases they say as far back as the 1300s where certain angles of the sun allowed people to see what they could not see with their normal eyes. But the phosphorus we see today that is used by forensic scientists, it's used to solve crime scenes because it identifies materials that can contain what they call fluorescent substances. And one of the most fluorescent substances that we have is what? Blood. So somebody may have viciously taken the life of someone in their home and they go out and buy detergent and Clorox and bleach and vacuum and they do all that and all the police have to do is come and just spray some, they call it aluminous, indiscriminately in locations of the house or under the new carpet that was just purchased by the criminal and it will light up like Christmas. And they'll say, there was a crime committed here. Black light. That was interesting. They said what they detect under the black light are phosphors. The law enforcement agency also under the something called risk Reactor crime scene black lights. They said, you can purchase these. They are used for close examination of crime scenes to expose evidence not visible under normal lighting or to the naked eye. Not only do they solve crimes, but they said black light can be used to prevent crimes. Here's how. They said, make your valuables less attractive to thieves by using police-approved forensic products that reveal your distinct identification marks on the items you own. So if somebody comes into your house and takes something and you go to their house and you see it and they say, no, that's mine, you just take out your black light and there are your initials. M-K-B, Mary K. Baker. That's mine. And they'll say, I didn't... I didn't see that. Today, black lights are more prevalent than you can ever imagine. Airport check-in, 
There was a time they asked for your ticket. Now they just ask for your driver's license or your ID. You notice the TSA agents, they just tilt it. They lean it back and forth under the black light to find that, that phosphorus strip that exists in a genuine form of identification or a genuine passport. It's there. Black lights also are used to detect forgeries in art. What I came to discover, uh, Durrell, was that there are artists that are amazing in replicating an original work of art, like a Mona Lisa. They are so clever. They can, they can duplicate that in ways that you can never imagine. But what they fail to realize is the paint used to create the Mona Lisa back in that day did not have phosphorus in it. But paints today, all paint, have phosphorus in it. So an art dealer, if somebody says, I have an original painting, they just take their black light and hold it up to this. It's not original. It's a fake in a matter of seconds. Because phosphorus exists in all paints today. Black lights are also used if you go to a bank or in a store. You give them a large bill, like a $100 bill. You notice what they do? They take out a little flashlight and they shine it on it because there's a phosphorus strip in, in, in genuine currency that does not exist. The best counterfeiters cannot counterfeit that invisible strip that exists only in genuine currency. And then on a more innocuous level, some of you may have gone to amusement parks before. You ever did that? And when they walk and after you pay the ticket, they go like this. They stamp your hand. And they said, you can go out and come back in. But they said, but, but I, I, I already gave you my ticket. They said, don't worry. We'll know whether or not it's you. And you come back and they grab your hand. and they go, Yeah, it, you've already paid. Phosphorus. It cannot be seen. You cannot walk into an amusement park and tell who has it on their hands. It's like the seal of God. You cannot see it, but God sees it because he seals you with Righteous phosphorus. And then I got a little crazy. I must admit, this is a little crazy. But I just want to give you a short list of all the things that black light illuminates. Tonic water. Black light will illuminate tonic water. Whiskey. But most of you don't know that. Vitamin B12 will light up under a black light. Chlorophyll, flying squirrels. <laughs> Not walking squirrels, flying squirrels. Scorpions. There are those that are very familiar with the forest. They carry a black light flashlight with them to keep themselves safe from scorpions. You know what else lights up under a black light? People. I think God did that so that nobody could sneak into heaven. Uh, our teeth has a sense of phosphorus in it. Antifreeze, gemstones, rubies, certain body fluids, blood, fluorescent dyes, laundry detergent. Among those, Irish spring, not dove. Mr. Clean, the spots on your banana when it starts going, oh, they will light up under a black light, but a good banana will not. Fishing lines, white paper, passports, most cosmetics, some animals, planets, and fungi, petroleum jelly, rock salt, fungus that causes athlete's foot. Check out your husband's foot when you go home with a black light. Turmeric, olive oil, canola oil, many flowers, certain post-it stamps, highlighter pens, and get this, those of you that cook, honey, and ketchup light up under a black light. I know you knew this one. Cotton balls. And to top off my short list, pipe cleaners, just to name a few. After that amazing communication about the beauty of black light, I've got to say this unequivocally, black lights matter. Yes. Amen? Amen? Black lights matter. But we will never know or realize the presence of phosphorus in anything until 
It is exposed to the black light. And I'm beginning to believe that one of the reasons why people avoid the deep study of God's Word is the same reasons why criminals fear a forensic investigation of the crime scene. Because it reveals what they don't want to see. Which brings me to my first point. Like black light, the Bible gives us directions in times of darkness. Can somebody say amen? You know, you, long before the GPS, we had a GPS. God's Word. God's potent scriptures. GPS. God's Word. The psalmist David, speaking about the phosphorus in God's Word, he says, Your Word is a what? Lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. Psalm 119 and verse 105. And so you find... The Bible will find you where you are, and with your permission, it will take you where you need to be. But you have to allow the Bible to be the light and lamp that guides you. What's so beautiful about that is when the Bible guides you, it guides you in ways that will amaze you. Because it doesn't guide you with just things you see. It guides you in moments that you cannot see. The Bible is not a surface book. It goes way down like black light looking for those phosphori, looking for the phosphors in your life, exposing the phosphors of your habits, the phosphors of your rebellion, the phosphors of your attitude, the phosphors of the way that you think about God and his word. It's in there. That's why some people don't read the Bible. You've heard me say this before. People don't like to read the Bible because the Bible reads them. And the Bible confers that. The Bible confirms that. Hebrews 4, verse 12, For the word of God is what? Living, the UV ray, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. See how deep that light goes? It even goes deeper than that. And of joints and marrows, and get this, this is the divine phosphorite, the, the, the illumination of God's word, the UV rays of divinity. And is a discerner of the, what? Thoughts and intents of the heart. That's powerful. God's Word. No other book can do that. Not your devotional book. Not a magazine. Not a great Sabbath school lesson. But God's Word alone is the only living book in your house. The only living book you own is God's Word. Because, as I mentioned in my earlier part of the message is, there are times that God chooses to show you what he knew you could not handle five years ago. Because you were not ready. He said that to his disciples. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot handle them. However, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will lead you and guide you into all truth. There are certain truths that God can't reveal to certain people because they're not ready for it yet. That's why you have to wait for the Lord to bring conviction to some people and not try to be what the Holy Spirit alone is. Did you get that? Some of us are just frustrated that our family members won't do this and won't do that. You can plant the seed, but until the Holy Spirit illuminates the areas that are the real issue, the thoughts and intents of the heart, They'll never respond to the light of God's word. I remember so clearly when the, the angels of God appeared to the shepherds in the field during the time of the birth of Christ. It was one angel, and they were terrified. But Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, the angel waited till the, till the eyes of the shepherd adjusted to the light before all the other angels appeared. Sometimes you've got to wait for your relatives to adjust to the little bit of light before you give them too much. Be patient. Try not to be the Holy Spirit when you are not the Holy Spirit. Amen? And let me go a step farther. If somebody just joined the church, don't try to make them a vegan on the first day they get in here. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a vegan lifestyle. But some of us make it a religious stamp or a method of salvation. It is good to have a healthy lifestyle. I mean, okay, 
Exhibit A. Okay. <laughs> that was terrible. I even said amen. I'm, I'm, I'm at a certain point in life where I'm thankful that I don't have to take medication. Amen? amen? Now, I'm not the best person health-wise. I mean, you all know I haven't bought a bar bag of barbecue potato chips for a long time. I'm fighting a, a winning battle because my wife and I are scanning everything we buy now. And I scanned my bag of barbecue potato chips with that, with that healthy scanner, and it came up zero. <laughs> and I put it back on the shelf. Sometimes you, when the Lord reveals something to you, you've got to make a conscious decision whether or not you're going to ignore what God shows you is not good for you. And so my wife rebukes me and she says, this is the natural one. At least it has 45 points and yours only has zero. Black lights do matter. You see, the Bible Like a black light, it allows us to see what natural eyes cannot see. You know, I met a person that was very well known. I won't mention his name, but uh, he's, the, he's related to somebody that's very common on television. And I told him about how I met with him and Talked with him, met him there in Midtown Manhattan not too long ago, and, and um, very well known, very esoteric, very wealthy, have any, everything you could want to buy. That is in the materialistic sense. And something about him didn't strike me well, but I decided this is not the moment. Love him where, he's, where he is. And we were talking on a particular topic and, um, and I tried to find a common ground to communicate. And I said, hey, well, if you have A, B, and C, why are we standing out here in the, why are we sitting out here in the car? Why don't we just come up to your place and show it to us? Come on up. And when we got up there, I'm being very vague on the story. We got to talking, and he was talking about the things that he does and the places he's been and his accomplishments. And, I, and he was so astute, clean, I, mean, I really, really appreciated the way he was communicating. And then I asked him, what frustrates you? He said, excuse me? I said, what irritates you? He says, religious people. <laughs> I said, now, you know I'm a pastor. He said, oh, no, you're not a regular pastor. You're safe. I already profiled you a long time ago. You wouldn't be in my apartment if you are just a religious person. You're a Christian. You would not be here if you are just a religious person. I don't like religious people. And I thought, thank you, God. And now we have each other's phone number. And he said, whenever New York... You see, sometimes you've got to allow God to take you in dark situations and let him tell you when it is time to turn on the bright light. Amen. But until then, you've got to let your light so shine before men that the glory that they see is not the glory because of what you said, but the glory of Jesus in your life. We talked and talked and talked and talked, and we had communications and conversations, and we had a, another lengthy, long conversation. So the reason I brought the story up was he talked about his background, religious background, and, and he says, as, pa as a pastor, how do you handle all the visibility and notoriety? I said, I'm just a lesser light reflecting the greater light. I'm a lampshade reflecting God who is the light. He said, you need to take some credit. I said, no. He said, I was raised in that kind of environment where all people always say, well, give God the glory. Why don't you take some of the glory? I said, it's not my glory. It's his glory. And then he said, well, here's my phone number. If you're ever in New York, hit me up and we go out and have lunch together. You got to allow your life to be a light that doesn't burn, 
but that exists in dark situations and let the Lord let you know when the time is to emit that ultraviolet light to let Jesus be seen. Amen, somebody? I mean, how many of you are frustrated that you don't have relatives that are in the church? And you're wondering, did I not say something right or did I say something wrong or did I offend them? And they'll say, Mom, no, no, I'm not offended by it. And I know you go to church. I know you're a Christian, but I just, it's just not for me. And you're thinking, in your head, this is what you're thinking. You are on your way to hell, and it's not for you. Am I right? And the Lord is saying, I'm not willing that any should perish. You chill out. I got this. So I recently bought my grandniece. I think I told you that. A Bible. And um, because of the illness of my sister, she just got out of the hospital today, the third time. My grandniece doesn't know God, but she knows her Uncle John. Every time I say, love you, she said, love you more. And I sent her things to read in the Bible. And I bought her a Bible. And I want God to just allow his spirit to work through me rather than me saying, Holy Spirit, I got this. Let me convert my family. He says, no, show them who I am and let me do the converting. And so I came to realize if you, if you, if you debate people that are intellectual, they debate you about the Bible content, but they'll never experience the Bible's intent. Because the Bible's content, anybody could debate that, but the Bible's intent is not to debate, but to transform. So information and transformation are not the same thing. So be careful when you meet people that have not allowed the black light of God's Word to search beyond the surface of their lives because they're natural, and if you try to run ahead of the Spirit of God, it's not going to work. It's going to backfire, and you can slam a door shut that will never be opened again. Amen. And Paul tells us why. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14, he says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Why? For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are what? Spiritually discerned spiritually discerned. You see, we've got to allow the Spirit of God. You've got to be, and pray for this, you've got to ask the Lord, Lord, keep me so in tune with you that when I see something that irritates me, because I'm so clean, that I need to shut up. Come on, somebody, say amen. Because some of you all know what I'm talking about. You see somebody ordering pork chops and you say, Ugh. Am I right? Or some of you are so righteous, you walk past a breakfast bar, they're serving bacon, you go, mm, that stinks. <laughs> and people look at you, what's wrong with them? Don't be so overly righteous that God, that you look strange. Rather than being a witness, you become an irritant to God. Am I right? Because people that may not be religious, you know what the devil does? When religious folk mess up, you know what the people of the world say? And you call yourself a Christian. The devil's just waiting for us to just. He can't wait to just. Dari, you go to that church. That's why I'm never going. But what I learned as I'm getting older is the simplest person can amaze the most profound most profound, natural-minded person if they allow God's Word to be the light source in their lives. You know, I, I watch Jeopardy every now and then. Jeopardy is boring, but I watch it every now and then. There's a lot of intellectual people. But you know what amazes me about Jeopardy, Donna, Ron, is when they get the Bible, the Bible category, these people that are smart about everything, they get dumb. How many people were on Moses' ark? Moses didn't have an ark. <laughs> you get my point? 
they, they, they come up with these answers that are just only spiritually discerned. And all of a sudden, we get excited when we watch a, a show that all of a sudden the Bible category comes up. All the Adventists get happy. Okay, I got this. I got this. I got this. Yeah. $30,000, $40,000. And we're answering all the questions. And these people that know, you know, what Socrates' second symphony was and, you know, Bo 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 you know, Beethoven's brother's name. I mean, who sits down and reads that stuff? The categories. But when we get excited when we see a Bible topic come up and we say, oh, yeah, and we're excited. When you allow God's word to be the source of light in your life, the day is going to come when people are going to be looking for some light and they're going to find it in your life. Amen? But you got to let it shine. That's why the Bible, David the psalmist, says it this way in Psalm 119, verse 130. He says, the entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the what? Simple. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. When you let God's word be the source of your light, you don't have to be ashamed. When I worked in Bank of America, I worked at, I worked at Bank of America, Bankers Trust, Citibank. I worked in the Wall Street area at law firms and insurance companies. I would always, you know, we'd go to parties and we have, you know, uh, job parties and Christmas parties and club parties and they'll invite you there and you're sitting in the circle where your boss and you are finally on the same level because you're in the same party. They're talking about stuff in the stock market and somehow God comes up and all of a sudden you say, like, wow, this is great. What are you going to say about God? And you realize that they're really not that smart. But you don't want to let them know that because you realize they are your supervisor. But then all of a sudden, which happened to me right here in southern Illinois. When I was down at the Sky Squires Field, the, 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 the RC club where we fly planes and helicopters. I never went down there with a suit on to fly my plane or with a Bible under my arm. And while the guys were cursing because their planes landed or because my plane crossed their path while it was taken off, and they'd get mad at me and I wouldn't get mad back I remember the day when one of the guys out there came to me and said, my wife is having a surgery tomorrow. Just remember her in your prayers. And I thought, how did you know I was a pastor? And I came to find out, we watch you every now and then. <laughs> you never know. Let the UV ray of God, light, come out at the moment that it needs. Yeah. Because those people that are looking for light, God is the one that has the switch, and he will turn that light on when the time comes for his glory to be seen. Amen? Second point about black light is this. Like black light, the Bible reveals the hidden things in us, not just around us. And that's another reason I believe why people don't like to read the Bible. The Bible is the black light that reveals the phosphorus in us, the hidden things that will be revealed when the Bible illuminates something in our lives. Uh, you know, I, 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 I could say from experience, the, the greatest struggles in my life has come when I didn't read the Bible. When you don't read the Bible, you're going to have difficulty. You're going to have hardship. You're going to have trials. And they're going to be the kind of trials that smack you backward. And then you're going to say, if I had only read the Bible when I should have. Because God's word never gets stagnant. But God's word is kind of like a candle. It'll burn for so long until all the wax is just gone and it stops burning anymore. And your failure is you never made sure that you had another candle to keep that light going. When you don't study God's word, the light goes off and you think that God can't see. And then all of a sudden, he brings you to the moment where he says, you know, I need to bring you to this moment because you have not been studying. And you think that I don't see what's taking place in your life. Well, God sees. Here it is. Hebrews 4.13, the black light of God's word. 
And there is no creature hidden from his sight. The divine UV rays. But all things are, look at the next word. What is that word? Naked, Naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. That's why I think it's so ridiculous that people think that somehow they're going to they're gonna, um, stamp you on your forehead with this mark of the beast. Or they're going to drill a hole in your head and put a, put a, 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 a chip. Or they're going to put it on the arm. No, God sees below the surface. He sees the condition of the heart and mind. Let this mind be in you. God sees what's in your mind. Isn't that, isn't that kind of startling? God sees you tell somebody off before you tell them off. Yeah. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. You see them coming. You, 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 you work, you, 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 doc, doctor, you, you're working on your words right now. I'm waiting. And you see them coming, and you, you're rehearsing silently. And God is saying, don't do that. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And you ignore that prompting of the God's voice, and you cross that line, and that person doesn't talk to you for a month because you did not allow God's still small voice to preempt your humanity. So remember, when you think that God doesn't know even how you think, oh, no, no, God knows how you think. All things are open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. All the stuff on your phone, all the stuff on your iPad, all the stuff on your Android or your Apple device. It's all there. God sees it. Whatever's under your pillow. Whatever, what's ever in your, in your secret room or hidden in the top of your closet or in the trunk of your car or your reading material. God sees it. If we don't allow God's word to be the guide in our lives, we're going to miss the things that God wants to show us. Look at this quotation. It's phenomenal. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 391, paragraph 1. I love the way this reads. The Bible is like a fountain. It's like a what, friends? It's like a fountain. The more you look into it, the deeper it appears. The grand truths of sacred history possess amazing strength and beauty and are as far-reaching as eternity. And I love the way it ends. No science is equal to the science that reveals the character of God. What do you say? No science. God's word is deep. I just told you about that. We, we don't always intend to read three or four or five chapters a day, but sometimes we sit down and read our Bibles and we almost kind of collectively together. Let's do another one. Let's do another one. Let's do another one. It gets addicting. You think chips are addicting. Read the Bible. You think Instagram is addicting? Read the Bible. Instagram will lose its hold on you, and the Bible will gain a hold of you. Amen. You think that entertainment is gripping? You read the Bible. It's got drama, intrigue, murder, violence, wars, bloodshed. It's got everything that man tries to put on the screen. It's in the Bible, and it's real. That's why we know the Bible was not written by men, because nobody would tell on themselves like the Bible does. Am I right? No, men didn't write that. They were inspired to put it in there. That's why the word that shines in God's word illuminates us in a way the world could never illuminate you. It could, it could turn a light on in your life. Don't allow God's word to become just a piece of furniture in your house. It could illuminate you in a way that the world can never illuminate you. Look at 1 John 1 verse 5. Look at this. The Bible says... This is the message which you have heard from him and declared to you. This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light and in him is what? No darkness at all. No darkness at all. So what is there in your arsenal that's more important than your Bible? If there's anything in your arsenal more important than your Bible, you're missing the best drama of the ages. You're missing how it's going to end up. You're missing what's going on around us. You're missing the central theme of the focus of it. I like this quotation in the book, A Call to Stand Apart, page 69, paragraph 1. We read these words. There is nothing more calculated to energize the mind 
and strengthen the intellect than the study of the Word of God. Can I get some Bible students in here to say amen? amen? No other book is so potent to elevate the thoughts. To do what, friends? Bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. Elevate the thoughts. To give vigor to the faculties as the broad, ennobling truths of the Bible. And here's what it ends by saying. If God's word was studied as it should be, men would have a breath of mind, a nobility of character, and a stability of purpose that are rarely seen in these times. God would be able to say, I could rely on will. I could, I could, call, I could call on will anytime. A nobility of character, stability of purpose, a breath of mind. If we would study God's word that way, we would stand out and somebody would say, what is it about that man or that woman that's so different? Because God's word is chiseling away everything that does not resemble him and developing everything that resembles him. But the problem today in our world, the dilemma of our world today is not the darkness around us, it's the darkness within us. We forget that we are not in a turf war, a drug war, or a political war. We are not in a competition for the best political leader. We are in a battle for the human heart. We are in a struggle for the human mind. We are called to be spiritually alive, to bring those who are spiritually dead and save them that are going to the grave that is Christless. There are people today that are marching to Christless graves but God can't call us to help them because we ourselves are not connected to God the way we should be. God chooses us so that we can introduce to those who are affected by sin Jesus, the master physician. Which brings me to my last point. Like black light, the Bible enhances our vision. In the dark. One of the reasons I, I know that we're living in the last days is because of prophecy. What word did I just use? Prophecy. prophecy. So people that walk around saying, God could come at any moment now. No, that's not the way the scriptures talk about it. The Bible gives us prophecy. We know that if this happens, that's going to happen. If this happens, that's going to happen. And God loves us so much, he says in Amos 3, 7, Surely the Lord God, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. God's not going to sneak up on us, so he's given us the Bible to understand that prophecy is there. And what is prophecy? Understand this. The gradual study of the Bible trains our minds to see what our eyes miss. You know what they call them? I, I don't want to pick on you, Will, but Will has this ability. You know, I would take my slides to Will so many times when Will was on the truck, we used to have a truck, but now we have a production room. And, and I say, okay, Will, here are my slides for camp meeting. And he'll, he'll call me, uh, there's a period missing. There's a quotation mark that's missing. Uh, where's the rest of the scripture? That's the right scripture, but the wrong, wrong reference. I say, come on, Will, give me a break. He said, we got to fix this before we put it on the screen. Once it's out there, you can't take it back. Amen. That's what the Bible is saying. The gradual study of the Bible trains the mind to see what the eyes tend to miss. And like black light, it can do in dark situations what no other book is able to do. But you have to become familiar with it. And that's why I like prophecy. It enhances our visions. Why do we sing the song, Jesus is coming again? Because the prophecies of God's word are being fulfilled just like he said they would be fulfilled. Here it is, the black light of the prophecy of God's word. 2 Peter 1, verse 19. What kind of black light is it? And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. Or as the King James Version says, more sure word of prophecy. Which you do well to heed as a light that shines where? In a dark place. The UV light of God's word until the day dawns and the morning star arises where? In your hearts. God's word. So when you look at that, when I, saw, when, I, when I understood how black light worked, all of a sudden I found the black light scriptures. 
They're all in there. This is a black light scripture. What does it do? It's a light that shines in what kind of place? A dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star, what? Rises in your heart. All of a sudden, you're seeing what you never saw before because you allow prophecy to train your eyes gradually to see what people that only look at the news will never see. And that's one of the reasons why, brethren, let's just please, I didn't plan on saying this, but let's allow the Bible to have more impact than politics. That's all I'm going to say. God's Word is not intended to be a microwave experience, like an oven. And, um, you know, sometimes Angie would call me. She said, turn the oven on for me. All right. She said, put it at, and she told me the temperature. And then I started realizing you can't just put food in the oven and turn it on and it's going to be ready. you got to heat that thing up. Right, ladies? Or those of you who are men that cook. So what I realized is like an oven, unlike a microwave, Constant study increases the temperature in our hearts so that when God puts the ingredients of his word in our lives, the bread of life comes out. I spent a lot of time on that. That's all I get. (laughs) God's word is so rich. If you study God, if you study God's word, it'll warm up. It'll warm you up to what is in there. Because if you've never studied God's word before, you think it's a microwave book. No, it's an oven. But you got to have your mind warmed up. Amen, somebody. You got, oh, do I have to read the Bible? Yes. If you don't read the Bible, the bread of life will never be formed in your life. My wife and I found out about that. We hosted a cooking program on 3ABN uh, for Christmas, and they showed it two years in a row. It's amazing how time flies so quickly. But my wife is such a good cook that at home when she's cooking, she's done it so much, so often, so regularly, that she doesn't think about ingredients and this amount of that and that amount of this. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about? You know, you have your favorite dish. You know exactly how to do it. You know exactly a dash of this and a dish. Uh, So once she calls me, she said, did you get lunch ready? I said, why would I want to mess up a good thing? (laughs) Because her lunch is always better than mine. So... All of a sudden, one day, they said, we want you to do a 3ABN cooking program. And, you know, Curtis is the chief of that section in that area. But, but for the cooking program, 3ABN said, well, now, pick out your favorite dishes. And we, my wife chose some things that were really, really good. But they said, this is where she hit the wall. She said, now we want you to list the ingredients in the recipe. <laughs> Come on, ladies. Isn't that terrible? You know, my wife said, I don't even know what I put in it. I don't know how much. You know what I'm talking about, Ressa? I don't know how much. They say, you know, is it one tablespoon? Is it a quarter tablespoon? I don't know. I just put it until I know it feels right. <laughs> and the way, and so this forced us in a, in a, see, it's not the cooking she didn't like. It's putting all the ingredients together. They forced you to do That's what we're tripping my wife out. I got to put the ingredients together. And even, okay, okay, I guess this is what it is, and this is what it is. And so... My job was to, okay, I'm at home. I look stupid in the kitchen. Okay, get out a quarter teaspoon of salt. Okay, put it in that baggie and write on there, a quarter teaspoon of salt. I'm putting all these ingredients together. So for the first time, I'm realizing what my wife put in that thing when she makes it. And I'm thinking, I wonder how it's going to taste because I've never done this before. Well, the good news is when she finished that cooking program, the production crew ate everything. <laughs> While Angie was in the back wondering, do you think it was good? Do you, th- do you think I did a good job? When she went out, two-thirds of what she cooked was all gone. Everything, every, the casserole, the drinks, everything was gone. The desserts, it's all gone. And they said, that was good. And I thought, man, my wife really knows how to cook. The ingredients that she uses, people love it. And the thought came to me, I can only imagine the ingredients that God put in his word. I could only imagine what kind of cook God is. If you don't read the Bible, you cannot taste and see that the Lord is good. You might look at it. How does it taste? You got to taste it. 
And when you taste it, you'll be able to testify as the psalmist David did. Psalm 119, verse 1 to 3. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Amen, Bible students. You got to read it. You got to read it. I you hope you're hearing me because here's the facts of the matter. The sin in us will keep us from the word of God or the word of God in us will keep us from sin. There's no third category about it. That's why I believe that people don't reject the Bible because it contradicts itself. People reject the Bible because it contradicts them. They have crazy people trying to say, well, the Bible doesn't jive with itself. So those of us that read the Bible, we have, there's a danger that is existing. And I gotta, I'm winding up, but I have to bring this danger out. There's a danger that exists among those of us that know this message that understand this message, that have lived this message and proclaimed there's a danger that we all are faced with, and here it is. You can be so familiar with something that you take it for granted and think it's always going to be there. But when Paul and Barnabas were in Antioch, they ran into some itinerant Jews and women in the city of Antioch that thought that they owned God's word and fail to realize that God's word must own them. And what did they say? Then Paul and Barnabas, Acts 13, 46. And Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you when? First. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. We turn to the Gentiles. And the danger we have is Seventh-day Adventist, Sabbath-keeping, eating right, right day of worship, sanctuary message, the truth about the second coming, the truth about the state of the dead, all those 28 fundamentals. That's the community that holds us together. But the Bible is the, force, the source of your strength. It's the source of your nourishment. If you're not eating that on a day-by-day -day basis, you are dying gradually. Some of you might go to the doctor, and if the doctor was able to detect your health based on the Bible in your blood, some of you would be severely anemic. He can't detect any Bible in your blood, or any Jesus in your blood, or any righteousness in your blood. Can you imagine if there was a test that way? I think God has a test that way. Remind me, uh, remind me of a little boy who... Um, you know, little boys like to go through closets, and this little boy was going through the closet in this house, and he found this old, dusty Bible, old, old Bible. And he said, Mama, Mama, whose book is that? And she said, oh, that's God's book. And he said, Mom, don't you think we should give it back to him? We never use it. Having God's word is not the same as God's word having you. The promise is in Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. Some of us pray, and we say, Lord, could you do this? And God says, I will do that. I want to tell you, when you live close to God, you start seeing how real he is. My wife and I pray certain prayers. Specific, we said, Lord, please allow Angie's surgery to be in the month of March. It's on March 1. We say to my grandniece, if you simply trust God, he'll bless you. It's that simple. And I don't think I had a chance to tell you this story, but we, we, we're in the airport telling this story to my... No, I think I, I told someplace else. I didn't tell you. We were in the airport, and I sent this devotional to my grandniece who just had her first Bible. And I said, be careful not to make God's Word complicated. If you trust God's Word, He promises to bless you. It's just that simple. So we're standing in the airport waiting to board, and, you know, we're Platinum Pro, so we're in Group 2, but they have, uh, long before that, they have parents that need extra time with little children. 
then the military, then the concierge, key. Well, you got to be like mega fly to be in that group because you only are there by invitation. Then group one, which is more, mostly first class. Then group two. So we're standing there just bathing, enjoying that devotional that we read in Oswald Chambers. He said, why do we make God so complicated when trusting God is that simple? If you trust him and follow his word, he will do what he says. So I sent that to my grandniece and I put it on the end of it. Believe me, it's that simple. So one of the ladies working at the airport walks up to us and we say, hey, we haven't seen you for a while. How are you doing? She said, well, how are you doing? We're doing good. Where are you going now? We're on our way to California. She said, well, why are you not on the plane? I said, well, they haven't called our group yet. She said, you can get, you can get on the plane before they call your group. Come with me. She walks us up to the counter, and she says to the ticket agent that's going to call the group, she hasn't called anybody yet, not even the mothers with children. And she says to them, let them on board before everyone else. And we sat down in our seat with an empty plane, and I looked at Angie, and she said, it's that simple, isn't it? <laughs> it's that simple. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things will be added. It's that simple. So we put it on Facebook. Some of you may have seen that post on my page. And at the end of it, I said, God just showed me, as I told somebody how simple it is to trust God, he showed me you're right. It's that simple. Let me give you an example, John and Angie. And here we are on the plane. Not even first class has a seat. Not in the concierge. Mothers and children not in, in the military, not on the plane. Just us. Amen, somebody. God is that simple. His word will accomplish what he promises it would. And so I say to people today, if all the neglected Bibles covered with all that dust were dusted all at the same time, we would have a dust storm like no dust storm ever in history. All the neglected Bibles, all that dust, if we all dusted it off at the same time, there'll be a dust storm that will be on the news. You got to let the Bible be the book in your hand. Amen? Because I say to the young people, if you carry the Bible while you're young, the Bible will carry you when you're old. David knows that. Psalm 37, verse 25, I have been young and now I'm old. What did he say? What did he say? Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Young folk, here it is. Not Instagram, not TikTok, not Facebook, not anything else, X, Y, or Z. If you carry the Bible while you're young, the Bible will carry you when you get old. And so as I close, I'm going to invite the praise team up, the family up. <laughs> Brethren, this is the darkest generation that the world has ever known. Why is this the darkest generation the world has ever known? I looked into this, Bob, and I found out something that has brought me to the conclusion that this is the darkest generation the world has ever known. This is the only generation that has the highest percentages of Bibles available, Janice. The highest percentages of Bibles are available in this generation in every format, hardback or digital. But look at the other side of that. It's the lowest percentages of changed lives ever in history. More Bibles in any form, any translation, any paraphrase, any authorized version, but the least amount of changed lives in this generation. And so now more than ever before, we've got to allow God's black light to appear in our lives. Here's the reason why. The Bible says, for behold, Isaiah 60 and verse 2, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. And deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you. And his glory will be what? Seen upon you. Because God's black light will reveal the Jesus in you. Here's my last quotation. Early writings, page 104, paragraph 2. Darkness is to cover the earth. And gross darkness, the people. And as nearly all around us are being enveloped in the thick darkness of error and delusion, I like this. It becomes us to shake off stupidity and live near to God. Some of us are just 
stupid spiritually. We can draw divine rays of light and glory from the countenance of Jesus. As darkness thickens and error increases, we should obtain a more thorough knowledge of the truth and be prepared to maintain our position from the scriptures. So when Jesus looked at Nicodemus and said these words, he was saying them to us today. Can we read them as I close together? John 3, verse 19. Let's all read this together. Here we are. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. So here's my, here's my appeal today. Do you want it to be your prayer that you ask God to illuminate the defects in your life? He wants to get out the defects in our lives so that when the darkness fully envelops the earth, people will see the Jesus in us. Is there somebody here today that by standing wants to say, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. All around my neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. When you allow God's UV rays to dig deep into the crevices of your life, he'll show you what should not be there, and then he'll put you on display to allow people to see him in you. So I say, friends, unequivocally, this is the generation where black lights matter. Come on, say amen. You want Jesus to shine in you? Let his word shine on you. And then only will you be qualified to let his word shine through you in this crooked and perverse generation. The prayer today, Lord, illuminate my life. Illuminate the defects. Illuminate the things in me that I missed so you can get it out of the way and I can be an unhindered light in a world of darkness. So we're going to sing a song that I'm so glad the young people are here today. They're going to teach us how to sing it. And I'm going to let Danielle and the Thomases lead us into this song. And we're going to sing this song like the song it is. We're going to sing it in the melody that we grew up with. Let's sing it together. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Okay, now before we go, you got a phone today? I'm authorizing you. Turn that light on. Let's turn the light on. Get your phone out, Android, or whatever it may be. We're going to turn the light on. We're going to turn the light on. We, don't, we're gonna li the, we, got the, we have the privilege to turn the light on. First time a pastor has authorized the use of a phone in church. Let's let that light shine. Here we go. Ready? Everywhere I go, I want to say, I'm going to let
Father in heaven, we light our, we light our lights today so that you can light your light in us. Lord, send your Holy Spirit to search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. We live in a dark, crooked, perverse generation and it wants to claim us as its own. Lord, help us to examine our hearts, our lives, everything we do in our day-to-day in our off moments and on moments, in our quiet moments and public moments. Turn that light on in our lives. Help us to find the illuminating UV rays of the beautiful, ennobling, changing, empowering word that you've given to us. Let us show us where we are still short of your glory. And then, Father, come in. Bring the construction crew, the Holy Spirit, Bring the convicting power. Bring the chisels and the hammers that exist only in your will and your way. Mold us and shape us that we can reflect the glory, the power, the image that the world needs to see. And finally, when the world is covered with darkness, may your people light it up that the glory of God may yet call someone as a lighthouse in a dark world, as a lighthouse in the troubled seas of these last days, somebody will see that light and find the ark of of safety. So this is our prayer, Lord. May we be sincere about this dedication. May you do in us and through us what we cannot do for ourselves. And we thank you in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. amen.